welcome to Crimes Through Time. This is the final part in a five-part series into the women of the Whitechapel murders, 1888. The links for part one, Mary Ann Polly Nichols, part two, Annie Chapman, part three, Elizabeth Stride, and part four, Catherine Kate Eddowes are in the description below. The focus of this episode, Mary Jane Kelly. Usually, I start a case by telling you about a person's early life, where they were born, who their family were, but even with the benefit of hindsight, historians cannot trace her roots or early life with any certainty. Even after her murder and all the publicity it caused, not one family member or friend came forward from her past. What we do know is that somewhere between 1883 and 1884, a young woman calling herself Mary Jane, possibly not Kelly at this point, arrived in London. It would fall to the partner for the final 18 months of her life, Joseph Joe Barnett, to be the narrator of what we know of Mary Jane's life. It is likely that there is some truth and some fiction in the versions of her life that she told him. One story is that she was born in Limerick, Ireland, around 1863. Her father, John Kelly, resettled the family to Wales, in Carmarthenshire or Carmarthen. He was employed as a foreman in an ironworks. She was one of nine, with six younger, still living at home in 1888. Brother was called Henry, or John Toe, who served in the 2nd Battalion of the Scots Guard. She was very fond of one of her sisters, who, quote, lived a respectable life, travelling with their aunt from market place to market place. Mary Jane claimed to have been married at 16 to a coal miner called Davis, who died in an explosion a year or two later. After this loss, she went to Cardiff, where she spent eight to nine months in an infirmary. From this stay, she met up with a cousin who, quote, lived a bad life. It was with this relationship that brought her to London and into prostitution. Another variation was that she was actually Welsh and that she had been disowned and her family lived in Cardiff. There are no Kellys, Davises or Mary Janes that match up with the census or parish records in those areas during the time period. This means it is a safe assumption to make that her name is a fabrication. In the Victorian era, it's not hard to reinvent yourself. Just move to a new area, give yourself a new name, and enjoy your fresh start. But there are clues that give away a person's background. A big one is education. Not only in the basics of reading and writing, but in a person's speech, their bearings, their interests, and often in their artistic and musical accomplishments. As we have seen from the other ladies in this series, Working class and even middle class women received an education with the view to generating income, needlework and domestic skills. Only in upper class, fashionable and expensive young ladies schools would draw in beyond the curriculum and the family able to afford the supplies to practice such a hobby. One of Mary Jane's landladies commented on her being quote, of a high level of scholarship and is a capable artist and she was generally described as an excellent scholar and an artist of no mean degree. She had no trace of a regional accent, Welsh or Irish, possibly as a result of elocution lessons. Mary Jane carried herself with innate class. She was always neatly and decently dressed and looked respectable. Jo Barnett said her father was a gaffer at the ironworks, but maybe he misinterpreted her meaning and he was actually the business owner or management that would have elevated her social class. It is more likely at 16 Mary Jane was a man's mistress or common law wife rather than legally married. Could she have had a child? It would line up with her eight to nine month stay in the infirmary. A neighbour commented that she had told her she had a two year old who would have been born in 1883. There is no record of a child but a family with enough money could easily deal with that. A publicly funded hospital would not have allowed a stay that long though. It is most likely a private institution such as a reformatory for fallen women or an asylum. A reformatory would have been the option for middle class families whose daughter had engaged in sex before marriage. Cardiff had two refuges, 
Protestant House of Mercy and the Catholic Convent of the Good Shepherd. Some middle class families saw female sexual desire outside of marriage as evidence of a mental instability, which needed to be treated by trained doctors. Cardiff didn't have a mental asylum, but there was the United Counties Lunatic Asylum in Carmarthen, a place Mary Jane claimed to have been. Mary Jane was introduced to the high end of the sex trade straight away, most likely facilitated by the cousin, who gave her name to a landlady where she could stay and who had the right connections to introduce her to the gentleman. Her landlady was, quote, a French woman, and she lodged near Brompton Road, Knightsbridge. A notorious madam of the Victorian era was Mary Jeffreys. She catered to the needs of aristocrats, politicians, wealthy capitalists and at least one member of the royal family. She had a network of residences run by female heads of household described as quote lodging housekeepers. Mary ran her operation from a distance to keep her hands as clean as possible. Clients would meet her girls by appointment only at various locations. Mary Jane's madam and landlady most likely ran her business in the same way although not on such a large scale. Appointments were arranged through letters, conversations in code, or chance meetings. Men never came to the premises. Given the proximity of Mary Jane's location to the Knightsbridge barracks, it's likely a number of soldiers were among her clientele. Maybe a Henry or a Jonto from the 2nd Battalion of the Scots Guard, who she would later tell Joe was a brother, that she then went on to maintain contact with when he was posted abroad. The men who used a procurus to meet women like Mary Jane were expected to commit to an evening of entertainment before receiving favours. An evening might begin at Jimmy's restaurant at 69 Regent Street or the Café Europe in Haymarket, served by waiters known for their discretion. The evening would end in a hotel room. Often a woman's company would be required for more than one night. Typically £5 was paid up front to book the appointment and the payment was then negotiated with the lady as to what services were required. This might include clothes, accessories and jewellery. Women of all ranks made themselves available for potential clients through public display, appearing in the promenades and galleries of certain musical halls and theatres. In the West End, this was the Alhambra Theatre in Leicester Square. One police sergeant estimated on a night, quote, at least 1,200 women of the town were present. The higher you went into the theatre's galleries, the less the women and their companions disguised what they were up to. It was said that once a woman goes to the sixpenny gallery, she is beyond all hope of rescue. Mary Jane was in her early 20s, fashionably stout, five foot seven, blue eyes and long luxuriant hair. She made an excellent living at the top end of the sex trade. She drove around in a carriage and led the life of a lady. She referred to herself as Mary Jeanette and was the owner of a beautiful wardrobe of costly dresses. Those at the Alhambra, Café Europe and Jimmy's would have known her well. well dressed gentlemen were often smitten with her, promising to shower her with presents, spoil her with food and wine and inviting her to accompany them to trips and events. Mary Jane was savvy. She knew her youth was fleeting and every opportunity needed to be seized with both hands. So when an invitation to go to Paris was extended, she agreed to go. As with every event in Mary Jane's life, the details of who this man was, where he met her, or if he was a client or romantic partner are unknown. The trip to Paris was not what it seemed and Mary Jane's French landlady most likely had a hand in it. When travelling internationally at this time, luggage was sent separately to the person. Mary Jane packed all her best dresses and accessories into a trunk and expected her madam to forward it for her to Paris. The trunk was never sent. Its absence might have been the first red flag that alerted Mary Jane that she had been deceived and she was now in grave danger. By the last quarter of the 19th century, trafficking of women between Britain and continental Europe had become a lucrative enterprise. 
the expansion of the railway network and reduction in costs of shipping made travel easier for people and goods. London had become a hub for receiving young women from France, Belgium and Germany. English girls were shipped out to work in brothels in these and other countries. In 1884, it was estimated 250 British women were sent to Belgium and northern France. Most were abducted after accepting a position in service or a sham proposal. They were plied with drugs and drink, given false documents and bundled into trains. Mary Jane was heading for a Masson Close, a state-sanctioned brothel. Once there, she would have had all her clothes taken and a new wardrobe provided. The madam would then insist the woman pay for the cost of the clothes and the cost of being brought over. The woman couldn't leave without being accused of theft. These brothels were also very tightly regulated. The women could only go out in public at certain times. They couldn't meet in groups, loiter near the doors or make themselves visible through the windows, which had to remain shuttered. New recruits had to register with the police and submit to twice weekly examinations for venereal disease. Once in a Masson close, with no family, no friends or support system and unable to communicate in French, there was little hope of escape. But Mary Jane did escape. She did not give Joe Bartner any of the details, only that she did not like the part, which he thought implied the purpose of the trip. She returned within a fortnight. How she got away is a mystery, but one theory is if she was as well educated as is suspected, she would have been able to speak basic French. If one of the human parcels, as they were called, could communicate with the police, they were a threat. And the legal statute stated anyone who suspected human trafficking might make an appeal to the police, who were bound by law to release any English girl detained in a brothel against her will, even if she hadn't paid her debt. This would leave the brothel and the traffickers out of pocket, and also have a witness that could testify to their crimes. Although Mary Jane didn't intend it, by fleeing her captors, she made some powerful enemies. She outran them in Paris to return to England, but her life in London would never be easy. The Ratcliffe Highway was as much a neighbourhood as it was a road, with an economy driven by the sailors who came in search of sex and drink. It was a dark and miserable place. It got its reputation for violence in 1811, when seven people were murdered in their beds in one of England's first serial killings. There were music halls and drinking cellars in the day, and then unlicensed pubs and opium dens at night. Mary Jane could not have foreseen that her life should end up on Radcliffe Highway, but she was left with little choice. If it had been safe for her to return to the West End and her life there, she certainly would have tried to pick up where she left off. She had a list of good clients, former lovers and others working in the sex trade who she could have turned to to help her resume her former life had she believed that she wouldn't be discovered. Instead, she headed to St Catherine's Dock and down the Ratcliffe Highway. She arrived at 79 Pennington Street at the door of Elizabeth Boku, known for subletting rooms for the use of prostitutes. 22-year-old pretty Mary Jane would have been just the sort of lodger she was looking for. It is unknown how much of her past she revealed to her new madam. It is likely she adopted the surname Kelly at this point. Her pursuers from France were looking for a Welsh woman, and becoming Irish and adopting a common name to slip into anonymity was smart. Even if she was penniless when she arrived, she would have assured her madam that she could easily make rent, although the clientele and practices were a world away from the West End. The number one category of clientele was sailors, who would habitually select a particular girl. The chosen girl would accompany him, carousing all night and sleeping all day with her in his bed. When he ran out of money or his shore leave came to an end, there would be another ship behind him full of sailors to take his place. The sex trade was more brazen, street walking in public houses, gym palaces and music halls. Even the police found it difficult to control prostitution and brothels. 
women walk the streets in quote not a bonnet or headdress or of any kind nor indeed any superfluous clothing women with youthful appearances would ply their trade in the singing rooms dancers with rouge faces dressed provocatively performed amid wooden waves with singers sang of lovely lasses left ashore the audience spoke swedish danish german portuguese spanish and french and likely didn't understand a word of what was being sung for they were happily slumped in the chairs drinking the bar dry and fondling the girls until a fight broke out everything on ratcliffe highway revolved around drink unfamiliar customers could be dangerous you never knew sober or drunk what kind of man they were if they were lucky the man would pass out drunk if not he may give her a beating it was in the girl's best interest to keep sober they would touch the glass to their lips and pour the rest away when heads were turned but drink numbed the misery and fear each encounter risked disease or pregnancy with men they found repellent it quieted the memories of violence and the thoughts of self-loathing and shame mary jane most likely drank throughout her career but it grew into a problem upon her return from france Mrs. Boko's sister-in-law, Elizabeth Felix, commented that she was one of the most decent and nicest girls you could meet when sober, but became very quarrelsome and abusive when intoxicated. Mary Jane's indulgence in intoxicants has started to become her unwelcome friend. Eventually, she was asked to leave. But she only moved next door to one breezer hill, a boarding house belonging to Mrs. Rosemary McCarthy and her husband John. They were running an unlicensed pub, selling alcohol illegally. They also used prostitutes to get sailors drunk and rob them. The McCarthys cared not about Mary Jane and her drunken antics, as long as she paid rent. Mary Jane had tried to prevent this happening. Shortly after she arrived at Mrs. Boko's, they tried to reclaim her stolen trunk. Mrs. Boko and Mary Jane travelled to Knightsbridge to reassure her former French madam that Mary Jane was now protected and posed no threat. The trunk was likely sold soon after Mary Jane left for France and the mission was unsuccessful. It was a dangerous move. Joe Barnett would tell that a middle-aged man came to Radcliffe Highway to find her, telling people he was her father. Mary Jane actively hid from the man who was certainly not her father. Mrs. Felix testified her family had discarded her, and Joe would also state that she never saw any of her relations. At the inquest, Joe would testify that Mary Jane was anxious for her safety, but never expressed exactly who or what she was scared of. Somewhere between late 1886 and early 1887, Mary Jane met the solution to her problems, Joseph Fleming, a plasterer from Bethnal Green, who fell in love with her. Mrs. Felix remarked, he may even have married her. But Mary Jane did have feelings for Joseph too, but after a few months of living in a simple one-bedroom flat, their relationship fell apart. Her friend would say he was violent with her. The first Mrs. McCarthy knew of this split was when Mary Jane was at her door at 2am one night in the early part of 1887. She needed a bed for her and a male companion. She took two shillings for the use of the room and didn't ask any more questions. After the split, Mary Jane moved to Spitalfields and took lodgings in Thor Street and worked a patch around Aldgate. Detective Chief Inspector Walter Drew claimed he saw Mary Jane, quote, parading along Commercial Street between Flower and Dean and Aldgate or along Whitechapel Road, fairly neatly dressed and invariably wearing a clean white apron but no hat in the company of two or three of her kind. A missionary interviewed by the Evening News said she never failed to be neatly and decently dressed and looked quite nice and respectable. Her neighbours were charmed by her humour and kindness, a good, quiet, pleasant girl, well liked. Mary Jane enjoyed singing and telling stories. She made no secret of her past adventures of her time in the West End and her fantasy life in Ireland, and her plans to, quote, return to her people. She was adept at hiding her real feelings, but she did open up to her 20-year-old neighbour, Lizzie Albrook, 
who had become enamoured with Mary Jane's tales. She starkly warned of starting a career such as hers, quote, she was heartily sick of the life she was leading. There is one account that shows a different side of Mary Jane. It comes from the 1965 book on the murders by Tom Cullen. He interviewed Dennis Barrett, who was a boy in 1888, and remembered Mary Jane. Of course, he might have been mistaken in his identification of the same Mary Jane. He said of her, Black Mary, a bit of a terror. She solicited outside the Ten Bells pub. Woe to any woman who tried to poach her territory. Such a woman was likely to have her hair pulled out in fistfuls. Could this be the Mary after a drink or three? The man who would become her primary narrator came into her life one random Thursday night near Easter. He was instantly smitten with Mary Jane, who he picked up for business, but it soon turned personal, when they arranged to meet each other the next day. Just 48 hours into the relationship, he was in love. He proposed they move in together on the Saturday, and Mary Jane agreed. He immediately secured lodgings on George Street. Their relationship would last the rest of her life, just 18 months. In November 1888, he would take the stand at the inquest, terrified and grief-stricken. Joe was 29 years old, blue-eyed, fair-haired, from Whitechapel, born into an Irish family and had a very fashionable moustache. Five foot seven, medium bills and physically capable of doing his job. He lost his parents at 13 and he was raised by his other siblings. His brother got him a job as a porter at Billingsgate Fish Market a specialist trade requiring a licence to transport goods to vendors. Finally, Mary Jane could give up working the streets. They both enjoyed a drink and this would be the source of problems during their time together. They moved four times, from George Street to Paternoster Row, from which they were evicted for non-payment of rent and drunkenness, then Brick Lane and finally to 13 Miller's Court in March 1888. It contained a bed, table, disused washstand, chair and cupboard. A print called The Fisherman's Widow was tacked on the wall. The owner of Miller's Court was John McCarthy, no relation to Mary Jane's previous landlords. He was a known bully and preferred compromised lone women as his tenants. Mary Jane took the rental of number 13 in her name alone. Joe would lose his job at the market, the exact reason is unknown, but it is likely that alcohol played a part. Quickly, the couple fell into debt to their landlord, who also ran a chandler's shop where they bought groceries, candles and other necessities on credit. By November 1888, they were six weeks behind in rent and 29 shillings in debt. It is likely McCarthy first suggested Mary Jane begin to solicit again. It had been a year that she had exclusively been with Jo and would not have gone back to the streets in any other situation but one of desperation. She must have felt betrayed and the resentment grew. The couple argued often and the situation escalated. On one occasion, Mary Jane smashed a pane of glass in the window beside the door. She stuffed it with rags to stop the draft, but it would never be repaired. Jo did try to find work, but only got odd labouring jobs, which would not be able to cover the rent. Mary Jane received letters from Ireland from her mother or brother. But it is interesting to note that the 2nd Battalion of the Scots Guard was stationed in Dublin in August 1888. Could it be her former paramour sending her money? She was also in contact with her ex, Joseph Fleming, who Julia Venturney, her upstairs neighbour, stated visited on occasion and used to give her money. Jo was not aware of this happening. For Jo, though, it was Mary Jane's insistence on mixing with other prostitutes and allowing them to come into their home that infuriated him. It was a reminder for him of her past, the fact he had let her down and that she had returned to that life. As they argued more and more, Mary Jane would tell Jo that she valued her friendships more than her relationship with him. By October 1888, the Jack the Ripper killing spree was terrorising everyone in Whitechapel. Mary Jane decided to offer a place to stay for women who had to go out soliciting to get their DOS money or were sleeping rough. She took in Maria Harvey, 
an unmarried laundress who didn't have enough money for a bed. This was the final straw for Joe. He knew Mary Jane was being compassionate, but it felt like she was pushing him out. He left on the 30th of October with a lot of remorse. He hoped for reconciliation. He took a bed at Bulmer's boarding house and he continued to search for work, looking in on Mary Jane daily. In the early evening of Thursday the 8th of November, he called on her. The smash window was still plugged with rags and a coat Maria had left was over it like a curtain. The couple had lost the key and had taken to removing the rags and reaching in and unlatching the door. But he knocked. She was in with Lizzie Albrook, who soon excused herself. Mary Jane had been drinking in the Ten Bells, but Joe testified she was sober when he saw her. They were together for about an hour. He told the inquest, quote, I told her that I had no work and that I had nothing to give her, for which I was very sorry. Her movements from then are unknown. Mary Ann Cox at number five saw Mary Jane turn from Dorset Street into Miller's Court with a man around 11.45pm. She said she was very drunk, but no local landlords remember serving her. She said to her as she entered her room she was going to have a song. Mary Jane's voice was then heard singing the song A Violet Plucked From My Mother's Grave When A Boy. Mary Ann says she heard her sing until 1am. What the male customer was doing during this 1 hour 15 minute concert is unknown. Elizabeth Pratner, who lived upstairs, said all was quiet at 1.30am. At some point, Mary Jane decided to go to bed. She took off each piece of her clothing and folded them neatly on the chair before retiring to her bed wearing just a chemise. At 10.45am, John McCarthy sends Thomas Bower to collect past due rent from Mary Jane. He receives no response when knocking. He pushes aside the curtain to peer inside. He sees the body and informs John. He ran to Commercial Street Police Station and reported the crime to Inspector William Beck, who returned to Miller's Court with him. It was several hours before they entered the room, waiting for Barnaby and Burgo, the bloodhounds. Eventually they broke down the door to find Mary Jane on the bed, her clothes still neatly folded and her boots in front of the fireplace. Dr Thomas Bond, a distinguished police surgeon, was called. Mary Jane's body was highly mutilated. The killer had had privacy and time, something he hadn't in previous kills. I can't tell you the details on YouTube, but if you would like to read the post-mortem report, I have linked it in the description. We will never know the real identity of the lady that was laid to rest. Because she called herself Kelly and claimed Irish roots, she was interned following a Catholic ceremony and laid to rest at St Patrick's in Leytonstow on the 19th of November 1888. If she had been actually Welsh, perhaps she would have been buried by the Methodists. Joe was all Mary Jane had in terms of family, and she now became what he wanted to memorialise. Her brass coffin plate read, Mary Jeanette Kelly, at Joe's request, harking back to her days in the West End in carriages as a lady. Her open hearse, two mourning carriages, and polished oak and elm coffin, decorated with two floral wreaths and a cross of heart seed, became a show of defiance. God forgive her, the crowd was said to have cried out. We will not forget her. Mary Jane's grave was marked with a simple memorial in the 1990s. This draws my series on the women of the Whitechapel murders to a close. I will leave you with a quote from Hallie Rubenhold's book, The Five. It is only by bringing these women back to life that we can silence the Ripper and what he represents by permitting them to speak, by attempting to understand their experiences and see their humanity, we can restore to them the respect and compassion to which they are entitled. The victims of Jack the Ripper were never just prostitutes. They were daughters, wives, mothers, sisters and lovers. They were women, they were human beings, and surely that in itself is enough. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe and let me know what you think in the comments down below 
and I look forward to welcoming you in the next one.